Okay, guys. Ready? Oh, wait. That's, that's you. That's this is the short. That's the short guy. That's yeah, the that's the little dick. That's the producer's that is a it's little dicket as hell. Little dicket as hell. It's little dicket as hell. Little dicket, little dicket, little dicket as hell. Are you boys ready to roll? Do it. Are back. I am back. I mean, it's been I've it's been a while. I've been on vacation. Yeah. I've been in sunny LA. Felix and I were just in amazing Buffalo, New York, had a wonderful time at an yeah. amazing music festival, hanging with our friends. Shout out to shout out to all the boys. Shout out to Mike, Alex, Chet, Tom, Aaron, especially the ETID boys, Keith, Yakoa, everyone. We had a fucking blast. But uh, one thing yo, we yo, didn't have we did not have cell reception. New, news. Like, I, I, from, like, the just weeks ago, went to L.A., turned my phone on, good vibes only. Yeah. Do not disturb. Going to Buffalo. They don't have cell phones there yet. No, yeah. It's all landline technology. Um, but we They're are... are getting last year's USA Today's now. We are, we are back in the city. We literally just walked through the door. We got Matt and Chris in the room. I know you guys have had a fucking exciting time, dude. So let's yeah, just fucking get yeah. into it. Uh, dude, UK trip. How was it, man? It sucked, man. Wait, 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 wait. So wait, wait, hold on. So you don't, you don't like who Corbin has picked for his cabinet? Yeah, that's bad. It's bad cabinet. All right, so the shadow chancellor has cast a spell on me. Um, but like seriously though, what what do you think should happen to Boris Johnson and the Tories now that they've they're out of power? I just want to give you guys a mental image of um, me and Matt lumbering through the streets of Liverpool. In the pouring hail, hailed, it hailed, fucking hailed, hailed on us, the size uh, of pencil erasers, bringing ourselves into the Liverpool live show, saying we are doing it, we are making something happen, and then cut forward twenty four hours to sitting in a dingy Manchester hotel room, putting out a new episode, and within hours, finding you got out owned the crushing defeat. You got owned of the Labour Party. Wait, what? Got owned, folks. And we were owned. We were owned. No two ways around it. Uh, as Barack Obama said, oh, uh, we got owned. All right. Well, uh, let me give you this competing mental image. It's me in Silver Lake, Los Angeles. I'm on a long board. I'm wearing shorts and a Hawaiian T-shirt and sunglasses, and I'm being pulled down the street by three or four beautiful bulldogs. <laughs> <laughs> They're running. I'm cruising. And I just like I do like the, the, the radical hand signal, and I'm just like smoking. It's cool. It's free weed out there. People were just throwing joints at me, and they were like, nothing bad can happen in the world, man. It's L.A. It's, I, su- it's sunny uh, out. Uh, Dr. Manhattan voice. It's December 11, 2019. <laughs> I'm longboarding down the boardwalk of Santa Monica. Tiny French bulldogs are barking at me in enjoyment. I'm loving every second. It's December 12, 2019. <laughs> I'm sitting in a din- on the plastic bedding of a dingy Manchester hotel room. Labor has just lost 86 seats. I'm crying. <laughs> well... Um, I saw a glass jaw for the first time. That was pretty cool. Congrats on that. No, I mean, like, I get, look, I'm not going to act like I didn't see the news. Like, I wasn't at the end of the season seething about the remainers, but I went down in the pit and everything's okay. We just got to go down in the pit, boys. We got to go in that pit. We're going to win. We got to go in that pit. I don't think I do very well in the pit. You got to get in the pit of the mind. I get the pit of the over. mind. I don't mean the actual pit. But. No, it was a... Uh, Funny, there was like, uh, it was like you know, just like just slaying fucking like just music. Like every one of those bands, uh, I told Keith, every one of the bands, but uh, him especially, seeing them live was like uh, the opening scene of T Two Judgment Day, where you just see the tire tread, the fucking tank treads of the HK just rolling over skulls. Yeah. That's what it felt like, but in a good way. And uh, Felix is just sitting there on the bleachers, looking like I was real, pissed, real sad. And he was, was just thinking was about sad. he was thinking about the Ramoners and Joe Swinson. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was thinking about how Joe Swinson never got a fair shake from the voters. <laughs> yeah. And then you got in the pit, you know, you got a staff infection, you know. 
I couldn't get a staff depression. Well, no, I mean, yeah, well, you got, you got your ten, It would take a lot. You got your 10th one. They punched your little card. I've actually get, gotten uh, free treatment. No joke. I've had over 10. <laughs> He's going to upgrade to MRSA soon. Um, no, um, this is obviously, uh, you know, this is our first episode uh, back together. If you're looking for some uh, big uh, cathartic moment about the UK, you're going to have to wait just a little bit for that one because uh, Amber is uh, still over there. And we're going to do a big retrospective episode on that when everyone's back uh, together. It'll be a family episode and all hander. Uh, but for, for today's one, this one, we're just... Uh, Happy to be back from our travels. Uh, I'm very happy. I mean, obviously, obviously that thing ended poorly, but it just sucks to be in the UK anyway as a general level. I'm always mildly depressed when I'm there, and I finally realized on this trip why. Because I always feel like there's just something spent about the UK. Everything, it's like America. It's like as developed or whatever, but it just feels just obsolete in a weird way. And I finally realized what I meant, what I, what I actually mean by that. If anyone has read the Stephen King novella or seen the TV movie The Langoliers, they, this, these people are, who are sleeping on a flight, sleep through it, going through a rip in time. Everyone on the plane who was awake is evaporated. And when they land, they realize that they've gone back in time, but that once people go through time, it, they just keep going and the time stays there. You know, so the place is just empty and spent, and it's slowly going to get eaten by the Langoliers. Uh, anyway, that's what the UK feels like. <laughs> Only there are people there. <laughs> it just feels like it has a time. Time has gone beyond it. You know, it, the world has left it behind, and they're still there, though. They're still nicking mobiles in front of the Tesco. They're still knocking over dustbins at the Sainsbury, even though the whole thing just feels completely doomed. Well, I mean... Like I said, I think we'll have a like a like a like a deep dive into just what happened and your guys' whole experience there. But um, you know, like a genuinely like my reaction to this was um, it, it it sucks tremendously, and you know, you're you're right to feel gutted. I mean, I I don't think like you know you, I'm not going to parse like you know what what should have happened or what could have happened better. But you're right to be angry. You're right to be gutted. And if you're here in this country, it's all the more important that it's it's just. It's just Bernie now. Yep. It's just him. He's like, he, he's the only one. He's the only one. And we got to get behind him. And, you know, as far as for our friends across the pond, what I got to say now, Ireland, it's up to you now. <laughs> Fuck that. You know what to do. Ireland, Wales, Manchester, the whole fucking Scotland. Leave it so the rest of the fucking country is London and Surrey. Leave them with that. Break the entire fucking thing up. Come out, you black and tans. Come the, out and fight me like a man. Be free of the eternal evil of the Anglo race. <laughs> destroy, destroy the dragon or whatever the fuck dumbass symbol you have for your shitty fucking island. <laughs> Break it apart. Let me see if if, uh, if Scotland um, goes independent, then like the official uh, their their official logo mascot is the unicorn that's been collared. Yeah, it can stop being a sub. Yeah, they yeah can it, 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 can be, it can be a dom now. It can yeah. be a fully a fully dom unicorn. Jobless it, alpha. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, shit, shit, uh, shit sucks. It's uh, very, very bleak, very bleak. But luckily, in this country, we still have hope. Buffalo Bills. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm to, okay. They're going no, to the playoffs. I don't watch football, but like that made me feel something when the Buffalo Bills somehow won. We were in this fucking, we were in this bar in Buffalo and it was like, I don't know. There was this fucking electricity I felt that I haven't felt in a while with the people there. Think, yo, Buffalo Bills, if they can win, we can win. Bills Mafia. I mean, I know it's like, it. uh, like, it's cliche or it's kind of, you know, corny to hope, hope is a dangerous thing. That's why she keep it alive. But genuinely what I feel is like, uh, as far as the opportunity we have right now with Bernie, who now stands alone. It's 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 important to feed that hope, to mind it, to tend it, to water it, and keep it going. And that like that you your actions are a part of your, you know, your your feelings of like uh, living in this world. Your feelings about your future, like you're a part of it. And just watering the garden just a little bit, just a little bit, or a lot, or as much as you can do every day, because Bernard Sanders is either leading or within the margin of error in California. Iowa, New Hampshire, and Nevada. Mm -hmm. The first, the first three primaries and the biggest Super Tuesday primary. So, 
I, I mean, I don't know what the future will hold, but like, it is very hard for me to imagine. And by the way, also last poll out of South Carolina, I saw second place. Jesus Christ! Yes. I mean, it's, it would be very hard for me to imagine we're going to get this close again. Oh no, no! This is the last off ramp. There's only one other Jedi, and it's Jean Luc Mélenchon. <laughs> and even the French, <laughs> even the French are too bowed for my boy Jean Luc, my my angel. <laughs> I love him. You, I don't care. Uh, no, anti-NATO, genuinely anti-Semitic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I want to clarify. I want to clarify Mr. Melanchon's comments. When he said France had nothing to do with the Holocaust, he means that Vichy France <laughs> isn't for. Okay, maybe we make some. It's like when Dennis Leary went on the Tonight Show and said that autism can be cured by spanking. <laughs> <laughs> All our heroes, all our heroes make some errors, okay? Maybe they could say things better. I want to add, I do want to add an add on to what Will said. Uh, it, it can feel like very dangerous dope right now. And, you know, as you've seen, there can be a genuinely fucking great guy like Corbin and McDonald who have dedicated their lives just to the betterment of others, to just. Making making their countries a better place where people actually care about them, uh, care about each other, and they can just be ripped apart by the biggest fucking reptiles and f monsters in an already fucking monstrous country. But you know, I feel like a lot of people they felt like a existential gut punch that day. I think it's preferable that you go out and volunteer or fucking you 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 phone bank, you text for Bernie, you donate. But if it if it feels you're not quite ready yet. Reality sometimes have to be has to be right in front of your face. If you feel too shitty, it's okay to like just focus on the world right around you right now. But there is on the horizon something you can do. Don't get overwhelmed by the moment. Don't get overwhelmed by every single bad thing in the world. And it is easy for that to that to take hold of you. But what you have around you, your family, your friends, is unmutable. Even if just a fucking pile of shit and undigested gin and solidified solid puddings wins in the UK that fucking goblin or whatever awful shit they're going to say about Sanders that's still there you're still there you're good uh, I mean keep I, rolling I just like the, I would only add on to that is like you know sometimes just wait for reality to knock on your door or be looking you right in the eyes I mean my only addendum to that is I would quote again those polls of those five states it's looking you right in the fucking face. The, your chance is now. Yeah. Your chance is now. You can't, like, if you feel too down, fucking get it. Like, but your I would chance understand, is like, now. I would understand if Sanders was, like, like, like we said, like, was Kucinich. Yeah. And he was in single digits and was just sort of holding out, like, keeping the flame alive, just to, like, talk yeah. about some issues or just, just like, give, give some people something good to feel about. But, like, no, like, this is, this is all or nothing. This is yeah. in it to win it. This is, you know, he's, he's, he is in right now the best possible position to win the to win this fucking of nomination everyone and, running and the yes. presidency yes of everyone running yeah or i think he's at, the, at this point i think honestly he's got to be considered the front runner or frankly if he had corbin level approval ratings which i think that we all saw. I mean, we'll talk more about it yeah. on the next episode but he they fu they fucking succeeded the media succeeded in branding that poor beautiful man as this either uh dipshit or psycho or anti-Semite, or whatever, and he just became this thing that symbolized everything wrong with the left broadly. Uh, whereas Bernie is incredibly popular personally, and there's zero way that they're going to, like, oh, no, just wait for them to really go after him. There's nothing they're going to pull out that's going to change that embedded of... It took two fucking years for the, the do it in the UK. Uh, and just while we're lingering on the emotional state, I have to say, you know, personally, and uh, hopefully not to be too ugly American about this, but, like, one of the first emotional reactions I had when we the exit polls came in was, frankly, oh no, what is this going to do to what we're trying to do in this election year in America? Like this, and we all see it already happening. All oh, the news yeah. coming out, oh, yeah. and in many ways of like, in probably even just anecdotally, almost everyone around you, the listener. Uh, who might be uh, Bernie skeptical or skeptical of your political appeals, your parents, your uh, uh, other friends, or, or uh, I don't know, uh, authority figures around you being like, oh, you see what happened in the UK? Uh, it's time to get off the Sanders train. He's going to get crushed. Like feeling that emotional threat to the necessary strength and hope that you need to go forward and <laughs> feeling weirdly like now is the time 
that we must <laughs> import the stiff upper lip of the British and resolve ourselves to being like, no, this is not the same. What is happening here is something completely different than there. And the bad things that happened in the UK election are only more reason to strengthen your resolve and not let it wa- waver. You know, again, like that's the thing with hope, like it's, it's always a risk. And, and Bernie is still a risk. You know, I'm not saying like it, it, it's an absolute lock or whatever, but like, oh, like, like it, it's better to risk him getting crushed than not risk anything or like have Joe Biden or, you know, Elizabeth Warren get crushed. You know what I mean? Like or, or have them get elected and nothing changes and it only gets fucking worse. And then you get President Tom Cotton. <laughs> yeah. Like, so it, it's all a fucking risk, but uh, it, it, it'll never be fucking more within our grasp or easier than it is right now. And I, I think that's that that is the thing I am thinking of and taking away from this, um, you know, and just and also just like we were talking about this in the car, Felix, like Corbin will have a better life individually now that he doesn't have to deal with ruling or that fucking rotten country. Yeah, he won't he won't have to deal with the fucking people that ripped his chances apart. We'll we'll talk about we'll talk about later from within in his own party. He will tend to his garden. He will tend to his cats. He'll have a great, t- you know, he probably has a great relationship with his his adult sons don't know their size average size yeah. yeah he won't be murdered by mi5 <laughs> yes seriously yeah yeah but well i mean i i guess like to 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 to, to move away from corbin and i know i know we'll talk about this probably later in the week but i mean the the the, the, the anti-semitism thing at least as it connects to america uh, I feel like we've been again our, our horrible lathe of heaven powers. Like I feel like I've been saying for like weeks, if not months, publicly and privately, what they did to Corbin, they are absolutely going to do to Bernie. And if you think that Bernie, being Jewish, the son of Holocaust survivors, is going to spare him that, then you've already been proven wrong just this week. And I, I, I tweeted it. I was like, it's going to happen. So just be prepared for it. I even I was astounded at the speed with which it happened almost immediately after the exit polls came in in the UK. Immediately. Uh, let's go down the list. Kicking it off is um, the, the, the woman who writes to the Washington Examiner whose grandfather is a literal, literal Serbian fascist who like, uh, killed the Jews during the Holocaust, saying uh, Bernie Sanders has an anti-Semitism problem. Oh, yeah. The, but the, Ch- the, the Chetnik granddaughter. Yeah. Uh, and then or shortly after that, uh, Noah Rothman. Uh, just begging journalists, please, please ask Bernie about his, his campaign's anti-Semitic associations. By that, which he means like, you know, uh, Linda Sarsour, Ilan Omar, uh, Rashida Taleb. Um, just again, calumny and slander of, of the most obvious, most nauseating caliber. It won't stop them. And then it goes from fringe Nazi adjacent right wing to a uh, more well-connected neoconservative right wing. Noah Rothman is a contributor or guest, frequent guest on MSNBC. And it goes from there to um, liberal fucking swine, uh, Michael Cohen speech, speech toy 71 saying, Hey, you know, this is something we really do need to talk about. And then from there, the lingual lad. Yeah. <laughs> and, and from there, the word wad. <laughs> and then from there, it's the rhetoric go- rascal. <laughs> <laughs> the elocution e boy. <laughs> you you can see you this you can see this human centipede working its way. You can see the turd working its way from like I said, <laughs> the fascist right wing to what will eventually be not a New York Times op ed, but a New York Times news article from one of their campaign reporters, I'm guessing probably Sydney Ember, to just will say something along the lines of some people are c- expressing concern about the Sanders campaign's closeness with anti-Semitism. Yep. And it won't, and it'll never actually be explicated, just like with Corbyn or any of this shit. It, it's never, like, just stated. Like, you'd think, like, to make a, that bulletproof a case, you would have to be like, oh, like, remember that time he, like, said on a hot mic that, like, fucking Jews control all the banks or whatever? Like, Well, what it is is, as it was in England, uh, when they say anti-Semitism, what they really mean is they think that Palestinians have human rights. That's what they mean. That's what anti-Semitism means. It means that you have any concern for Palestinian rights. That's it. That's what it meant for Jeremy Corbyn. That's what it means when they talk about it with Bernie. And that's one of the reasons why the retort when people said labor is anti-Semitic, Corbyn's anti-Semitic, when you say, yeah, but look how anti-Muslim the Tories are. Well, yeah. I mean, English people don't like Muslims more than they don't like Jews. So 
they got to turn anti-Semitism out of a guy saying, you know, Palestinians have rights because that feeds into their general and an Islamophobia that they have. I'm sticking like I, I would say like even further than that, though, obviously, like there's the um, like, yeah, yes, like any 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 critique of Zionism or let's be honest, just the, the Likud Israeli right. Um, is de facto evidence of anti-Semitism. Yeah. But I would say it's going even further than that. I I would say we're getting to a point now where any critique of capitalism just as such oh, yeah. Yeah, is yeah, yeah, going yeah. to be interpreted as evidence of yes. anti-Semitism. Because if you're talking, like, I mean, you're talking about, like, you know, like, uh, the, the, like you know, for the many, not the few, or the 1%, or, like, the elites that are, like, you know, destroying our lives and everything, people are going to, either because they're stupid or in most likely cases, completely evil cynical people will make that seem like uh evidence of bigotry or yep. prejudice of some kind yeah i know uh you can't use octopus as a metaphor for like capital the way it functions uh because that exclusively refers to jews even though that was the name of a book uh written by muckraker frank norris about standard oil you know like it originally was a fucking um you know, uh, uh, a robber baron epithet. You can't say you can't say Zionist. You can't re- refer to Zionism, even though the uh, one of the largest bodies of Zionists in the United States is just big fat Christians like Mike Pompeo. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that a huge portion of millennial Jews just don't give a fuck about Israel. We have no connection to it. No, it, it all means Jew. You the the only way to fight anti semitism is just assume. Every war, every every word with a bad connotation is Jew. I'm not even really convinced it was the anti-Semitism shit that really. No, like, it wasn't. That, that, it that, played that, a part that, though. That, that did it made? I'm sure it played a part. Remain did a way bigger part, and, but we'll and, get and, into it. And like, the, with, but the part, it, the part it, it does play, and and the part that they're going to try as hard as possible to the role that they're going to cast it in for uh, Sanders. And if you think it's bad now, wait till if wait till he wins a primary. If you think it's bad now, if you think this is nauseating and absurd and like uh, just. Just like so ludicrous that you can't possibly imagine someone would would do it or be serious about it or advance it in like let's say the paper of record, then I gotta say, get ready for what's coming. What it does do is people who are sort of low information voters or disengaged or you know or just regular people who aren't sickos who don't follow politics in the same way that we do or keep up keep up with all of this stuff. If you say something enough times in the media, you don't really have to like explain it or fill in details. But with something like that that is so heinous, like, you know, like a, a, a terrible prejudice like anti-Semitism, if you say it enough times about a person, people who are disengaged will just be like, who don't really follow it, will just be like, well, oh, that's bad. Obviously, he's bad. It reminds me of the scene, remember in Sicario, where they're driving into the city and they see, like, the bodies that the cartels have, like, just burned and throw off a fucking highway? Mm-hmm. And the guy says... It's brilliant what they do. When they mutilate a body like that, they make people think they must have been involved. They must deserve such a death because they did something. Oh, it's brilliant what they do. <laughs> and, like, the point is that, like, they were just anyone. Like, just it doesn't matter. But, like, the, the display of it is so gross and so over the top and so evil that the average person would be like, well, he must have done something to deserve it. Or there must be something there. And, and I don't want to be an anti-Semite or I don't want to be, you know, a prejudiced person. Um, and, and that's that's what they're going to do to Bernie Sanders. And the fact that he is himself Jewish is no protection whatsoever. I mean, I think it's some protection. I, I don't think it's going to work in a, like uh, to the degree that it worked against Corbyn, which I think is very much in the air. I don't think anyone has been able to quantify it yet. My guess is it's not that big. But, it, you know, depending on how you define it, it had some contribution. You're right. Uh, I don't. I don't want to overplay it. Like, like, oh, this is like inevitable and it's going to sink him. But like, I'm just saying, be prepared for it. The fact that like, the fact that it won't work or that it's so desperate and insane will not stop them from doing it and doing sure, it a lot. Yeah. But you so know, I'm just saying, like, maybe, be prepared for it is what I mean. Right. That's just they're going to throw a lot of things at the wall and they're going to pursue what sticks. So we might not have any idea what's coming yet that might actually be effective. I don't know. Uh, Matt, this is something that, that you were talking about earlier today, where it's just like the idea of, um, and then I want to I want to talk about, again about about Mayor Pete because it, it dovetails so nicely. <laughs> the idea of like any, I you know, anyone overall, but especially anyone under forty who like just doesn't fuck with Bernie or like doesn't get why he has such a large and essentially immovable base of support 
is just so weird to me. Those it's just people so are baffling. the ones I understand the least. I think I understand the MAGA mind pretty well. I feel like I get the uh, centrist cuck mind, and I get, uh, you know, the different flavors of Democrats. I certainly understand the the religious devotion of the K hive. I understand the uh, bookishness of the Warren fans, but who I do not understand are people who are like, why is Bern- Why do so many people like Bernie? I don't get it. Like, what is it? He's this old man who yells, and yet there's still this huge chunk of people who love him. I do not understand it. And it's like, even if you can't get out of your own world enough to even imagine what might be going on outside of your life to make his message appealing, I just don't understand what is wrong with you. It's like trying to empathize with a reptile. I, I was thinking along those lines because I, you know, I forget who did it. It was like a, someone who does oppo research or comms for one of these fucking Democratic mutants did this whole thing where it was like comparing Pete Buttigieg and Bernie Sanders before they were 40. Oh, uh, yes. And they were like, you know, Pete Buttigieg, Rhodes Scholar, Harvard, uh, Naval Intelligence. Yes. <laughs> um, like McKinsey <laughs> Consulting Firm, Mayor of South Bend, Indiana. Air like, America. Bernie, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Operation Phoenix. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, yeah. He, uh, no, he, he was personally responsible for creating the, uh, the jobs and the motivation of uh, Afghan villagers to produce more opium for the warlords they had been sold to. Man, since we mentioned on the show, hey, he looks like he might have been a CIA agent, the amount of fucking <laughs> shit that's come out in the last couple of weeks about his career, not just with McKinsey, but the story about how he went on a vacation to Somaliland. That is so funny. Uh, when he was uh, with McKinsey, just like as a trip, as a little jaunt, and he wrote it up for an op-ed in the New York Times. And his co-author is a guy whose entire resume is all USAID shit. And everyone knows, it's been basically acknowledged that USAID is a CIA front. Like all those development projects in the third world are all CIA operations. Um, so he's doing some sort of like mission to the fucking like the separatist leaders in Somaliland on behalf of the U.S. government. Didn't he say that he met with local leaders Look, while leaders. he was there? Who doesn't love going to an active war zone on vacation and then meeting the local leaders? I yes, actually, you do. I actually, last vacation, I actually started a long-distance book club with HDS. <laughs> Um, Felix and I actually did meet with the local leaders of Buffalo. We did. <laughs> yeah, Keith Buckley. We, Keith Buckley at every time I die. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 They, um, really are, they really are the princes of that city, though. No, it's, they it's are. It's pretty amazing. That's the best thing you can be, um, like the, the king in Buffalo. That fucking uh, owns. Also, fix the price of bread. Yeah, no, like, okay. Like, remember, he was just like, like okay, when, it, for, when, he said, when his work at McKinsey first came out, again, once again, we were like, McKinsey, like that's like working for Moloch, yeah, like a uh, horrendous, like yeah. If you like, if you're an average person who's had any interaction with McKinsey at all, they are the people. It's if the umbrella the two, corporation. Yeah, yeah, no, they're the two guys in office space who come in to fire yeah, everyone. Right. They're just like they like they when they're brought in to consult. It means we're gonna fire people, hire non-union workers, or just generally make the lives of employees yeah. and workers or anything like hell. And then like, okay, the defense of that was they were just like, mm, you know, people are gonna be pretty disappointed about my work at McKinsey. You know, I work for, you know, a Canadian grocery chain. That's pretty, that's pretty boring. And then we were like, people were just starting to say like, well, at the exact same period of time, there was this massive price fixing scheme involving a Canadian <laughs> grocery store in which they had to pay out like $15 to every man, woman, and child in Canada yes. to atone for. Some people, you know, from Canada still haven't gotten their check from the, yep. from law. And you know how that ended? You know how it ended? Uh, because someone at one of the other companies whistle blew, not McKinsey, which means Mayor Pete did nothing about it, while other people were actually driven to fucking talk to the people it, it's, it's it was the wrong. Per- it's the perfect Mayor Pete scandal, though, because it's like if you want to fully understand it, it's just intensely boring. Yes. It's not like, it's not like you know, it's not like Pete went around like just fucking being, you know, just like sticking people up. For valuable minerals he just did some incredibly fucking dull 
bread scheme. But it's and it failed. It failed. He did a failed, boring bread scheme. It's like, if you want to know what the Pete presidency is going to look like, it will be that. But at the same time, doing bread fi- bread price fixing is something out of like Dickens' hard times. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Like, what a Dickens villain. Yeah, it's like, um, um, let's collude to um, illegally control the price of probably the most basic food staple <laughs> for an entire population of people. And then, jo- the, okay. It's like his name in, in the novel would be like Governor Jonathan Hardtack. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, please, no. please, sir, Barrister Coldheart. <laughs> <laughs> Me wickets is acting up. My bread was a halfpenny yesterday, and now it's two whole pence. Uh, no, we pe- got pe- more and more gruel for a living. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Pete Buttigieg's uh, bumper sticker should be uh, just Buttigieg 2020. Are there not workhouses? <laughs> <laughs> He's like he would be the perfect Dickens character because anytime he has an interaction that isn't just like Jimmy Kimmel's AI pleasantly flickering <laughs> at him. <laughs> he's he's just like he just fucking you just see the rage he had that he didn't actually get to kill anyone in Afghanistan. He is he's the ang- he's the most pissed guy up there. Oh yeah, no, no one he, is more. He, he's even, got bloodlust. Yeah, no, even Seth Bullock, who is blackout drunk at every debate, (laughs) Sheriff Governor Seth Bullock of Montana, he could not match the fucking fury that little demon has. The other things we know he did, outside of his classified work in Afghanistan, which, by the way, he might have been doing Operation Condor shit, but my gut is that he was just siphoning development money to make absolutely useless uh, fucking, uh, you know, decks full of... God damn it. I cannot remember that word. It's Dex. But it's no, Dex. what is it called? Photoshop, but the other. PowerPoint. Power... Why can't I remember the word <laughs> PowerPoint? A deck is a PowerPoint. God damn it. <laughs> you okay. go... Matt, you don't know because you're, you're a good human being. Yes. O- only demons yeah. know, know shit like So this. PowerPoint. Yeah. So he over he, he stole development money for PowerPoint decks. That's, that's what I think he probably did. But the other stuff we know he did. Uh, he worked for a. A large nonprofit, a non-profit. healthcare company oh, in Michigan nice at the exact year that they and that Blue Cross Blue Shield, a large nonprofit in Michigan, uh, cu- fucking reorganized by reducing uh, fucking coverage and uh, firing people. Well, the, I mean, I hate making this my role on the show, but do you guys want to hear the uh, Pod Save America oh, position? Boy. Oh, on yeah. This? You are oh, such yeah. a fucking. You well, look, love Felix, pain. you you will respect this. I, I mentioned before I listen to Pod Save America when I'm at the gym because I need something to get angry to make me move faster. Chris, listen to Stained. It's healthier. <laughs> it's true. Here's here's their position. Uh, the the line today was something along the lines uh, of, <laughs> well, if you want if you want to bring up these records, it's fine. Just be accurate about it. Pete himself said that he worked at Blue Cross Blue Shield. Quote, reducing overhead expenses among supply chains something like two years before they laid these people off? That's nothing. So reducing reducing overhead costs at a large insurer prior to the ACA. What do you think that means? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Or their exact words were uh, reading Pete's quote about reducing overhead costs and at the end saying, my eyes are glazing over just reading yes. this. Yeah. Yes, no, and like I said. I have, like, a, like, I have an ADIQ. Nice, no, dude. no, but like, I mean, even, even like, I don't know, like, you know, you, don't, you shouldn't have to understand half of this shit. But it's exactly the same thing with the bread price fixing thing. And they're like, he's like, mm, I just did a few Excel sheets. And like, I'm sorry, that was, uh, the, I think that was um, uh, Eichmann's defense in Jerusalem. <laughs> um, but no, but like they all, they all play it up like it's, um, like it's just so boring and wonky. It's not, it's not evil or whatever. But like forgetting that's basically how evil operates in our world. Yep. But even if you get past the boring shit, what they were actually doing was all blood curdling. Yeah. And, and yeah. The, first of all, why does Blue Cross Blue Shield technically a nonprofit in Michigan. That's bizarre. Second of all, here's the other defense that I've heard that he himself said to Rachel Maddow. He turned it back around to be like, oh, like I, I, what I did, I got all these people laid off from their jobs. He's like, well, I, well, under Medicare for all, like everyone who works for the health insurance uh-huh. industry got laid off. Oh, like, you know, so, so that, that, that's coming back around on that. So it's like you're laying off 2,000 people versus laying off, I don't know, like how many people, you know, who do you know, push, yeah. push paper around an office for health insurance industry is like, you know, it's probably in the hundreds of thousands or something like that. The answer to that is, well, the Bernie Sanders Medicare for All plan has like a like a very, very generous severance for everyone and, and like job retraining and all that stuff. Number two, why is it the like people who are bureaucrats in just demonic private health insurance companies? Why are they the only people we actually care if like government or capitalism destroys their jobs? Yep. 
if they worked in a fucking mine or yeah. like a car factory or something, like no one would give a shit. No, they just say, off, buddy. Yeah, yeah. like get, get, a, get, a, get a new degree. Like, yeah. you know, just get a, the creative destruction of, you know, uh, entrepreneurial right. forces, blah, blah, blah. And the third final point, let me just make. Yeah, I, I do agree that everyone who works in a private insurance company probably should lose their job or at least their, their, their function of working for a private insurance company. Not that they shouldn't have another job or not have an income again. But as far as their jobs go for those companies, they shouldn't exist. No. The, the, what Pete did, what the interesting thing about Pete, though, is that he didn't lay these people off because they were essentially inefficient or because private health insurance is bad. He laid them off because that's his job. Yeah. He would have done it for any industry that McKinsey had been hired by. Oh, yeah. the, the function of the job is irrelevant. That's what Mayor Pete does. You want to go and talk about layouts. what he did to the United States Postal Service? Bing. He, now, this one he can't even claim like he has before that he wasn't involved in the actual bad stuff. He was on the team that recommended to the U.S. Post Office that they save money by, you guessed it, reducing staff through automation and replacing union workers with non-union workers. What a genius. Yeah. How did he come up with that data set? Thank you. That yeah, was you definitely need... worth the fucking $50,000 retainer they had to pay for you that. You need at least six years of schooling to come up with yeah. that shit. Uh, and one thing that Matt and I were talking about this uh, uh, while we were walking through the hail in Liverpool uh, was the other defense of, of Pete is being like, well, look, this is just a job he took out of college when he was 24 or something. And it's like, look, you either get to claim that your guy is Doogie Hauser or not. Yeah, right. He is yeah. either a kid he is either genius. a wonder because he's got to be a wonderkin to be president this young. Have, yeah. Everything he has to do has to be amazing and show brilliance. Yeah, so from he, the beginning, he can't be a snot nosed punk. So he can't only have ten years on his resume, but five years of those don't count. It's all yeah. got to. It's all got to count. It's all got to lead towards his one thing. That is his argument for being. The guy, and if he's just taking half of his Wonderkin resume and being like, well, well, that 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 stuff, like the important thing is that I got the name. What I actually did there it doesn't matter. Then he hasn't done anything. The, the, yeah, yeah, you can't use the fucking Lincoln Chafee excuse when they asked him about why he voted for the repeal of Glass Steagall, <laughs> which was I had just gotten there and my dad had died. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, I've been up for four hours. Yeah. Does anyone have an Android charger? No, the Grubhub didn't bring my order. <laughs> my, my Possible Burger isn't here. I'm hungry. All right, this is getting very pointed. <laughs> uh, no, but he, the, the work at McKinsey is so fucking evil because, yes, he's doing bad things. He's recommending bad things. But he isn't even really doing that. When you hire someone like McKinsey, it's not for them to come up with something for you to do because... We all know what they're going to do. The answer is always the same. You know, make people get more out of get more pr uh, production out of people at less cost. That's that's what you do. But you cut ways to get that. And that's what they're going to do no matter what. They hire Kinsey to have an excuse to do it. Yes. They hire Kinsey to be like, well, we brought in the guys and the guys told us this is what we have to do. This, there's no alternative. That's literally their job. So you're not even doing anything. You're just taking a check to sign off someone else's evil fucking choices. Just the worst kind of scum. Slug people. And, uh, you know, back, back to this comparison about, like, oh, well, what, what, did, what, did, what did Pete do before he was 40 versus Bernie? And, like, you know, the, their, their knock on Bernie, and they think this contrast makes Bernie look bad and Pete look good. And this is the thing that they can't wrap their head around. Is they're like, you know, oh, Bernie, you know, he bummed about, stole cable. And I believe one of the things this lady came up with was uh, made some film strips. Yeah. And I was like, what? This, also, this is a Pruder film strip? What? Also, a father at 29. Oh, a father at 29. That, that was, was the, the weirdest, weirdest one. one. Yeah, babies that, having babies. I that, was like, wait, does, did that mean he was too old or too young to be having a kid? That's right when the man's biological clock runs out. <laughs> well, I don't know what that. That's just my favorite thing that I see online. You're going to see it all throughout 2020. Someone getting so fucking pissed, they don't even know what's normal and what isn't anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where it's just like you see a photo of someone you hate and you're like, nice button fly, asshole. <laughs> oh, do you open that? Do you open that thing to take your dick out and piss, you fucking moron? <laughs> <laughs> like, what, dude? Or it's just nice, uh, nice fucking electrical outlet in the background. Will you plug your toaster into that pussy? Ooh, I want my bread warm. What? <laughs> So yeah, uh, uh, Bernie at 20 uh, drove a moped. It's like, what? wait, is I supposed to be mad at this? Did you, I don't know. Did you, like, yeah, Bernie, Bernie at 29 drove the homophobically named moped from GTA Vice City. <laughs> you sure you were standing up for LGBT people then, Bernie, huh? Okay, so like, uh, we don't have the comparison of what Pete's done with his life after 40. Not yet. But his first 40 years should give you a pretty fucking good blueprint for that. Uh, we do, however, have one for Bernie. And what he's done 
is pretty fucking impressive. This be a pimp. Long shot, long shot candidate for Burlington. Complete, complete, like, sea change of a mayor. Completely change in, that fucking in, place. In, like, yeah, let's talk about his record as mayor. Yeah. Like, he stood up for LGBT right, LGBTQ rights before that was even, like, that was in the 80s. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, had a social housing program. Yep. Had a foreign policy. Yeah. As a mayor of, and then, like, and then, again, worked his way up through state politics to become a long-serving U.S. senator. That's pretty fucking impressive. Pete yeah. Buttigieg hasn't done anything that fucking uh, Pete uh, good Pete Buttigieg ran, ran for one statewide race and got treasurer. fucking washed. He couldn't yeah. get he elected straight fucking state washed. treasurer. In, Mr. In, Mr. In, Charts couldn't beat whoever the Indiana GOP candidate was, which was like a fucking lawnmower with an iPad cat <laughs> game on it that said spelled out build the wall when you hit the yarn. He, even though he went to the Indiana State Tea Party and begged them for endorsements. Yep. Yeah, that, that was no. pretty impressive of him. I mean, honestly, people like wonder that. why this young guy's him. running for president. It boils down to he's fucking boxed in. He's in a state that's not going to elect another Democrat to a statewide office probably in, in the foreseeable future. So he's got to circumvent uh, the state uh, ladder. Uh, so he's got to name, 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 make a name for himself uh, and then either like get in the cabinet or maybe luck into VP or something. Remember when he failed to run for head of the DCCC? Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, and I remember being like, this jumped up little motherfucker being the mayor of South Oh, Bay. wait, it was, he was like, running for the head of the DNC. Yeah, sorry, DNC. I and now he's going to fucking D whatever presidency. City. The gall. And then, of course, though, so this is now, so we had the, the peer, Mayor Pete bubble a couple of weeks ago, and it's now it's starting, the air is starting to go out of it. Bloomberg's catching up What's to not, <laughs> Yeah. What happened, uh, it, like, it didn't catch on the way they wanted it to, clearly. It wasn't as convincing. It didn't have the that sort of avalanche effect where eventually it just snowballs and everyone just just agrees he's so smart. And now everyone is pissed because there have been like 18 <laughs> articles in the past two days of people being like, what's wrong with Pete? Why don't you like Pete? <laughs> I, I, I have one here for you. And then this will get into like, again, sort of like the thing we first started talking about, like the people who don't get it or are baffled why like an old guy like Bernie has such diehard support among young people. And why young people don't look at someone like Pete Buttigieg as an aspirational figure or someone impressive or, you know, admirable yeah. in any way, in any way. Yeah. All right. So this is this is this comes courtesy of uh, The Atlantic, or I like to call it um, America's most reprehensible magazine. By, Piece of shit. By far. I mean, I would say absolute liter dog paper. literally if your parents read The Atlantic. Swap it out for the Costco magazine. <laughs> I'm not kidding. They will become better people. I would Fuck say, that fucking rag. It is not fit to wipe a cat's ass with. I mean, like, both in terms of, like, actual, like, prose, style, literature, journalism, and the knock-on evil that they've produced in the world. Soldier of Fortune magazine is superior <laughs> yeah, to absolutely. the Atlantic in because every so single way. Soldier of Fortune is just insane guys lying to each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just guys whose entire face is aviator sunglasses <laughs> being like, yeah, I was actually made the head of the Contras and he's never left Missouri. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like it just is like in the Bernie presidency. The government should secretly buy Soldier of Fortune. It's just like a pen pal program for insane guys. <laughs> and then you just make sure they don't shoot up anything. Whereas the Atlantic's track record, far, far oh worse God, than yes. even than even the fantasies of the people who write yes. into Soldier of Fortune's yeah, magazines these are. These are some, uh, major when, league evil here. All right. So this is uh, courtesy of Derek Thompson, staff writer at America's Worst Magazine, The Atlantic. Why is the young left out to get Buttigieg? I wonder why. Here are four theories. The candidate represents a new age of Democrats without representing its politics. Young progressives on the Internet don't seem to like Pete Buttigieg very much. Uh, nor do voters. Uh, <laughs> They've called him the most obnoxious type of millennial, a boomer wrapped up in millennials clothing, a build-a-bear for middling Democrats, a <laughs> candidate seemingly dreamed up by some Democratic National Committee algorithm, a baggie full of uncut special interest talking points, and a grab bag of gifted and talented party tricks. Buttigieg is a young person's idea of an old person and evidently some sort of bag. All right, here's what I'll note. He links to all of those insults. He chose all of the most um, just inartful, wait, soy, wait, fucking wait. weak yeah, bullshit yeah, yeah. imaginable. He, he's, he's, okay. he, um, yeah, um, he, he, he's also been called a, uh, a rat face fuck. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's been called 
a CIA opium warlord from Afghanistan. <laughs> I mean, he's I call these things all these things uh, by me personally. He's and been I would called like to be a, quoted. He's been called a fucking T eight hundred program to cut entitlements. <laughs> he he has been called a satanic bread scammer. And he's he has just, been called Greg Stilson. <laughs> he's evidently some sort of bag. Uh, I can think of one type of <laughs> bag he is. A D starts with a D. Oh, uh, yeah. No, I like how all the insults in the article are like, Pete has been told, turn on your monitor, my dude. <laughs> Pete has been called an epic twat waffle. <laughs> <laughs> Pete, yeah. He's been told to get shucked, bootlicker. <laughs> yeah. He's been insulted by some of the most insufferable dorks online. <laughs> he has been called a corn cob 385,000 times by people whose next tweet is like, hey, y'all, I just got banned. Please refollow me. All right, so... The online left is not the electorate, and its views don't represent a generation of voters. Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. Um, well, I mean, uh, the, the views of the online left, shall we say broadly, certainly represent more people than read The Atlantic absolutely. on a monthly, monthly basis. That's for sure. But youthful distaste for Buttigieg isn't an internet illusion. In a recent, in a recent Quinnipiac poll, Buttigieg placed second in the Democratic field among voters over 50. But He's he, a nice young boy. <laughs> he was given a, a Werther's candy <laughs> by 90% of voters uh, of the... Uh, he was skin. given a 25-year T-bill. <laughs> he, has been, he has been the last words of thousands in hospice care who <laughs> never get to vote for him. <laughs> but he earned just 2% support among young voters under 35. His popularity among those aged 35 to 49 is about as high as his overall number. Buttigieg hate is tightly concentrated among the young. This level of vitriol is confusing for several reasons. Buttigieg, 37, would be the youngest elected president in American history. Nobody ought to vote for Buttigieg or anyone for that matter just because they almost share a birth date. But one might think that historic youthfulness would be enough to buy him at least, say, three whole percentage points of the national youth vote. Why? Yeah. You just said you shouldn't chud do that. You shouldn't pick. If you well, sh if well, no. What this, categorical what, imperative. If you shouldn't pick people for that reason, then no one should. Uh, what uh, Derek Thompson, again, staff writer for uh, America's most evil magazine. Piece of shit. Uh, is saying here is like, look, no one's entitled to a vote just because they're relatively of the same age cohort. But he should be entitled to probably be polling at at least uh 25 30 maybe 40 they're basically saying he is entitled to 25 yes. he's entitled to like double digits at the very yeah. least yes by virtue of his age alone what's more Buttigieg receives the sort of scrutiny one might expect from a front runner despite being way behind in national polls joe biden represents the far greater threat to the young left's favorite candidate bernie sanders wrong wrong well we'll see we'll see i'll see but, um, okay, Joe Biden represents the far greater threat to the young left's favorite candidate, Bernie Sanders. But Biden seems to avoid much of the highly personal animosity heaped on his You know what part of it is? I've been thinking about this. I mean, like, I honestly think at this point Biden is a bigger threat r realistically than anyone else. I mean, his numbers are going down. But if they don't go down a little bit more, it could be really problematic. The problem is for people whose politics is based around, you know, the online own, it's hard because there's literally no Biden voters on the internet. Yeah, the, the Biden the Biden voters on the internet you run into are incredibly pleasant. Yeah, because and they're they're, not really they're on paying a drug attention cocktail. to anything. Yeah, so you're not going to be able. You're going to be like the meme of the guy, the alien yelling at Picard. That's oh, Darmok and Talagra at Jihad. <laughs> That's going to be you trying to talk to the Biden voters. They're going to. It's just going to be going over their heads. Try telling a Biden voter he's corn cob <laughs> well it's not grilling season yet pal <laughs> i saw one i did see one hardcore biden voter once online who was very online and in her bio she had bi hashtag biden front <laughs> <laughs> the Biden <laughs> front yeah it was an offshoot of the chetniks <laughs> <laughs> i mean like here's the interesting thing I, I, I think he does kind of get why Pete Buttigieg is more viscerally repellent to someone like me than Joe Biden, even though they r roughly represent like Joe Biden's career certainly vastly outstrips Pete Buttigieg. Oh, yeah. The evil that he's committed in his life, which, like we said, at 37 is still very impressive. Well, oh, Joe, yeah. well, Joe had already been able to win statewide races. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, that's no, the no. difference. Yeah, he got elected yeah, at 30. Yeah. At yeah. 29, technically. He made confusing comments to literally everyone in Delaware in an afternoon, and they elected him <laughs> by acclaim. <laughs> He went around and said, oh, well, this just looks like a five dog afternoon. <laughs> and people, people were like, what? Okay, I'll vote for you. All right. So uh, what's going on here? Let's begin with the most straightforward explanation. 
Number one, don't overthink it. They hate him because he's not a socialist and his early state poll numbers are rising. This is the obvious answer, and frankly, it might be the only answer. In the past well, two- then I'll shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> in the past two months, no candidate has gained more than Buttigieg in the early states. If he wins in Iowa and New Hampshire, he could block Bernie Sanders' path to the nomination. And this deeply concerns young progressive activists who rightly see the Democratic primary as a zero-sum competition to lead the party in a winnable election. Are you and, listening to that Warren dipshit? Yeah, uh, yes. At least this guy understands it. Attention, Elizabeth Warren supporters. A zero-sum competition to lead the party in a winnable election that has the potential to redefine the Democratic platform for a decade or longer. Indeed, sir. Warren supporters. Wait, why don't they just form a unity ticket now? I don't get it. Yeah, I don't know. Is that not a thing you can do? Uh, What? You're saying it isn't? Uh, Buttigieg, far more than Biden, has the youth and vigor to command the party for the next generation. Speaking of Darmok and Talagra Jihad. Um, And this makes him the graver threat to those arguing for a socialist revolution. This explains this explanation takes us pretty far, but I'm not sure it quite captures the level of sulfuric hate and the progressive objections to his candidacy. I'm going to skip ahead here. He doesn't mention his face or voice at any point during this. Yeah, I mean, like if to be totally honest, like someone with identically shitty policies to Pete, Amy Klobuchar, don't hate her. You know why? She's honest. (laughs) She's honest about who she is. She never made a tweet that was like, but. I sense a fail. I'm for Medicare for all. Like she is who she is. Can't hate her. You you have a, you have another reason for um not yeah, hating her. Quite maybe I want her to come to my apartment and yell at me for not having a couch. <laughs> 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 you stupid piece of shit. Where are people supposed to sit? You don't think about anything. Oh, that would be awesome. Number two, keep not overthinking it. They also hate him because they think he's a liar. There's no question that Buttigieg, glimpsing an opening in the moderate lane, has tacked toward the center in the past few months. He initially seemed to support Medicare for all, and now he openly criticizes the effect it would have on private insurance employment. (sighs) He initially proposed radical government reforms, such as packing the Supreme Court and removing the filibuster, but now he's recast himself as a moderate unifier. As a result, the left sees him not just as any moderate, but as a moderate masquerading as a wonder kid grassroots progressive. When my colleague Elaine Godfrey spoke with a Sanders supporter in North Carolina, he told her that Buttigieg, quote, threatens to put a fresh face on the most nakedly cynical underbelly of the post-triangulation Democratic Party. Sign that kid up. (laughs) Sign him up. Let's bring him, call him up to the majors. For the young left, political moderation might be a misdemeanor, but eloquent moderation donning the costume of progressive activism is first degree phoniness that merits the punishment of crude criticism. The punishment <laughs> oh, no. of crude Not criticism. The crude hey, 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 Derek, um, political moderation, that's not a misdemeanor to me. And the thing you just described, it deserves something, but not crude criticism. Oh crude criticism God. is what we do because I don't have any real power. <laughs> yeah. Number three, overthink it a little bit. Young people hate him because he's a traitor to his generation. Okay, starting to get a little bit warmer here. It's a little bit more. I want to dig down into the, the, the depths here. Let's get, let's go. Generational identity is arguably the most important dividing line in the Democratic Party, more than class, race, or education. As I've written, the young left has become a kind of third party awkwardly domiciled within the Democratic Party. Buttigieg, however, is a traitor to his generation. He is a 30-something millennial who appeals mostly to middle-aged and older white voters. In this way, his candidacy violates a certain unwritten law of U.S. electoral politics. American voters have historically appreciated candidates who, from a socioeconomic perspective, identify down. Franklin D. Roosevelt was a traitor to the upper class. Trump is the real estate billionaire who speaks for coal miners. (laughs) Bernie Sanders is the septuagenarian senator who rallies the young left. But there's not a deep history of successful candidates who appeared to identify up like a young, non-millionaire, small-town mayor who aligns himself with cosmopolitan capital. Identifying down can be a proxy for authenticity, but identifying up invites accusations of inauthenticity. By rejecting young progressive activism, Buttigieg betrays his generational class identity. Okay, what I'll say about this is that it's not a matter of identifying up or down or that it's like it's phony of him. No, this is the most authentic thing he could possibly do as a human being, as, as who he is, is identify with, as he puts it, cosmopolitan capital. I don't think it's phony. I think it's evil. Yeah. I think his aspirations, his ambitions, the things he believes in, the things he's worked towards, and the things he will do as president are evil. Yeah. No, it's as simple as that. 
his body of work is already evil or pointless, probably like in a 90, 10 split towards evil. And on a larger scale, I can't think of it. Uh, I can think of few things more horrifying for an executive branch run on the principles of McKinsey. Uh, most Just mass death. Most kiss asses are very authentic about kissing ass. Yeah. And it's like everyone knows someone like that. It's like the, it's this weird like intergenerational class identity. Like, no, like everybody knows someone like this and they're all pricks. And like, again, like the path he chose is, as this wonder kid, what we're finding out is like, I, I saw something, I saw something the other day where someone was talking about how like it was some fucking, some fucking squirt stain. Um, he was just saying uh, like the unspoken thing going on in the Democratic Party right now is how like previous jobs that were like a path to politics are becoming poisonous, like working at a white shoe law firm, working in consulting, working at a, you know, uh, bank or Wall Street firm. And like being, that's a, gonna, being a prosecutor, being a prosecutor. Yes. Being a prosecutor or a fucking soldier or something like that. A military officer, I should say. Um, and they're like, you know, they're like they, he was like, this is going to have big ramifications going forward. And it was sort of like a couched in a like non judgmental way. And then you look at all the comments and people were like, this is insane. What are we just going to become the party of service workers? And it's just like, could you imagine if there was no one in politics who ever worked for an insurance company or a Wall Street bank? Oh, and no. it's just like, oh. yeah, no, I mean, that's it. Like the 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 contempt that these people have for like the idea that their political party would represent or cater to the in interests of people that they regard as below them, as underachievers, as not smart is is upsetting to these people but it's because i think i would say like of if the millennial cohort if such a thing can be talked about as like a political demographic or movement the more that it becomes doing these things are evil they make you evil they mark you and not just as untrustworthy but as someone who is fuck a traitor to your generation you're a traitor to like the human race itself that's what I think about Pete Buttigieg and people who work or follow similar paths into politics and power and, from that and money. And as much as uh, Derek is trying to, you know, write 2000 words about like young generational inter interclass divides among the young online left. I think there is a very real thing here where uh, the emerging cohort who is not among Pete Buttigieg, but is not Pete Buttigieg. Uh, might be a somebody who went to grad school for graphic design and is saddled with three six figures of student debt and genuinely feels more solidarity with somebody who is a service worker than somebody who is an upwardly mobile uh in like in young insurance VP and that is part of the you know as in as much as he's saying intergener inner class generational conflict whatever that he is seeing and part of the disdain for. Buttigieg. I mean, yeah, I think that's a great point, Chris. And like a, a perfect example of that is like the right wing does this all the time with uh, AOC, where they always talk about how she's a, just a bartender. But I swear to God, those fucking like at, at the just at the edge of 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 their like sort of of what's coming out of their mouths, the fucking the DLC fucking CAP fucking Democrat people, they they come up right to the line of saying that about AOC because that's essentially how they view her. If you were the same way as someone who was just a bartender before she was in politics, because they are uh, um, are accredited, they're credit mongers, they're VC humpers. They they think that the reason it's horrible, the reason that they would tell you that it's horrible to imagine no insurance executives or lawyers or anything uh, being go government is because in their mind those are the only things that qualify you for the job because they give you knowledge of how things work as opposed to some plebeian who doesn't really have any understanding through the jobs that they do uh, when really you know all you're learning in those jobs is the ideology and you know how to how to advance the interests of the, those uh, forces that you're being paid for and most by. critically and as anybody including myself who has gone to a semi nice university and tried to get into these job tracks will t tell you if they're being honest at all the majority of the thing that you're getting from any of these educations or work experiences is meeting the other people who will then give you the better jobs, the more high paying salaries. Yes. It's a, it's it a, is it's as much a, a social network. club as it is uh, gaining any tangible skills. Yeah. All right. Number four and final uh, reason. Overthink it more. Young people project an extreme hostility. To so is he trying to just do the galaxy brain meme with a different term? Yeah, yeah. Get out of here. This is the, a new format of four paragraph essay that is the galaxy brain yeah. format. Or uh, Vince McMahon getting more excited. <laughs> 
Uh, overthink it more. Young people project an extreme hostility toward Buttigieg on the internet in part to exercise their own anxieties about success and increase their in-group status. Again, I think he's missing the point that it's also very fun and funny <laughs> to do as well. So Dude, that's just increasing your in-group status. That's clout. That's clout. That's shit clout. Is right. 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 So like this magazine just needs to be fucking euthanized. <laughs> This is terrible. Like, why is this an article? Who's fucking, I don't care how, like, what doctor's office you're in, what, like, luxury wing of a hospital you're in, where they're just, like, shooting fucking the blood of endangered species directly into your prostate. Who the fuck wants to read this? The, the, his, he ran out of ideas so bad that his fourth point is just filling the space is, like, well, people like engagement on their posts. This week. <laughs> this is fucking dog shit. This, week, this, guy, this guy should be retrained as, like, I don't know, a gas station attendant. This fucking sucks. This week, I tweeted that the stark age gap of Buttigieg support suggests that he performs a specific archetype in this race. Your polite, hyper-achieving high school friend who delighted the parents at the Christmas party with his piano rendition of Silent Night, which made your friends roll their eyes so hard their retina is detached. I guess he knows someone like that. I don't uh, know. Yeah, no, that class. Yeah. I, I, dude, we yeah. all had the Silent Night friend. <laughs> the fuck are you talking about shut up older and richer educated liberals look at Buttigieg and see a flattening reflection of their young selves or offspring young educated liberals look at Buttigieg and see a nauseating caricature not of the person they are or even the person they wanted to be but the person they felt pressured to emulate but never quite become an outcome they regard with tortured ambivalence Buttigieg is the guy they hated in college, not only because he was obnoxiously successful, but also because his success sat uncomfortably, hauntingly close to the v version of success they once felt prompted to achieve. Well, I mean, it's a good thing Derek doesn't have to have any of the uh, you know, in-group about being pressured to succeed because he's gotten a pat on the head from Jeffrey Goldberg. America's fattest war boy. criminal. <laughs> <laughs> well, not since the last no, not surgery. Anymore. Not anymore. Not anymore. Yeah. He's now a big deflated Jeffrey. <laughs> yeah, just like a, a balloon that's just a balloon animal. Yeah, he's sadly popping around the room. So this is my grand unifying theory of loving and loathing Pete Buttigieg. The South Bend, Indiana mayor doesn't offer any kind of new that, deal. Hold on. That's not a unified theory, you fucking idiot. That's four things. You just it's four yeah, you separate ideas. You, you fucking unified cunt. it, moron. That's a separated theory. Fuck you. Fuck moron. you. Fuck you. Fuck you. <laughs> the South Make instructional YouTube videos about like fuck, ASMR or some shit. Uh, his next article at the Atlantic. Uh, four reasons why Chapo Trap House loathes me. <laughs> <laughs> I will forget this guy the moment I am, <laughs> yeah. like step foot in my apartment. But just the act of reading this article, I now hate him more than anyone else on earth. <laughs> All right. The South Bend, Indiana mayor doesn't offer any kind of new deal, green or otherwise. Wow. Rather, he offers one of the oldest deals in politics, generational cl change without class warfare. Oh, OK. Maybe he's got a germ of an idea here. This is both why many older Democrats find his candidacy appealing and why many younger Democrats find him intolerable. The chief aim of progressive activism is to transform the U.S. political economy, not to pass the baton of neoliberal incrementalism between generations. But Buttigieg represents a new age of Democrats without representing its politics. This makes his campaign something more than a threat to the revolution. It feels, above all, like a betrayal of his people. Derek, I think, you know, he, he pulls it back there at the end, and I think, like, you know, he's not... Maybe I've been too hard on Derek. Maybe I don't know I've been if too, I have or haven't. I don't know I if just, I ever yeah. haven't, but like, I just, why do I hate Derek? You write for the Atlantic. Sorry. You should have gotten, you shouldn't have got a shittier job. Like, <laughs> honestly, you should have just like, I don't know, tried selling weed. No, I like, again, I'm you not. Any fucking heart, you'd be out here stealing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not going to hate Derek in like 20 minutes. I, I like, look. You know, he doesn't work for them. It's just going to be some other smooth guy. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah. But, uh, just I didn't enjoy hearing the article, Derek. I'm sorry. Sometimes you throw out some clunkers. I understand. Jeffrey's breathing behind your neck and his the breath coming out of his nostrils smells like fucking soup. I understand. <laughs> big just a big wet cloud of breath. Oh. <laughs> Mayor Pete's getting a lot of grief online. Why don't you write about that? I get it. It is rough times. Yeah, no, I mean, shit on G, yeah. Derek. Yeah, I know. yeah, yeah. But I didn't like hearing it. That's G all. Man. Gigi's only, Derek. I understand. Gigi's only. I know. Uh, I, 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 I understand. Everyone needs a fucking job. We're all sipping out of the same fucking poison shit broth. 
God's working on all of us. Uh, God's working on all of us. But, like, you know, I, I understand, Derek. Uh, Jeffrey does run the newsroom like a uh, prisoner of war camp. <laughs> yeah. That, he, he's, he, that he's a guard of and he, abuses you for fun. <laughs> to, make, to make his fat, doughy face and small, tiny heart feel anything at all. He needs to make his little cashew throb. And the only way he can do that is through um, uh, tormenting those weaker than under him. Once a year, he gets to pussy pop in Tel Aviv. <laughs> this isn't that time. You know, he's just got to make people fucking crank him out. So, he's a grinder. You're a grinder. Yeah, I mean, I guess, like, the, the path to redemption is just, I don't know, leak all of those company emails. Oh, yeah, get that shit out there. Get, there's got the to be some, I, gotta I be some dirt. I don't, no, Derek, I don't want to get you in trouble. We'll, like, it's just he's gonna put you up for this. I think like a classic prank, like unscrew the office salt shaker when Jeff's about to use it. Classic whoopee cushion. Oh, how about this? Uh, just leave like very small pieces of like raw chicken, or just like at the very bottom of filing cabinets in his office. That's another classic prank. Well, all right, let's well, uh, good rotates, guys. This is I know this is a this this is a hard one to do. Um, we're all fucking exhausted and gutted, and you know, uh, it's it's a late episode. Uh, but um, we will be back uh, very soon with, I think, a, 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 a full house episode. Yeah. Uh, going everywhere good. you look. Uh, yeah, no, exactly. Uh, we'll get the we'll get, we will get. I promise the full report on uh, the funnest trip ever. <laughs> Yeah, it was great. Yeah, we, yeah, we yeah. were jealous of you guys the entire <laughs> yeah. time. Um, it, was, it was delightful. All right, till next time. See ya. Cheers.